Mona. She's the only rival we've ever had who's a champion before we've even met her. The question is, do we reckon she could actually beat her own game? Well, I wanted to find out. Therefore, what I'm doing is I'm gonna play through using only the Pokemon she uses, and to make it that bit harder, we're gonna be using the exact same movesets. This looks close enough to her, right? The first thing we're going to do, though, is pick a starter. Now, Nimona does actually use one of the Gen 9 starters, and in theory, they are all allowable to be used. However, I've got a feeling she's a Sprigato sort of a girl. If you guys want to disagree with me on that one, you can. However, that's what I've picked, and that's what we're going with. I go down to the beach, and I see something that frightens me. There's two of me? We quickly have to beat down this fool and their Quaxley. A uh, Quaxley? You're not a real Nimona using that. Get out of here. Oh, you poor little thing. Here, take a potion. We'll get you revived. I'm sorry, what? Take the potion, you ungrateful little. It would seem that he didn't care whatsoever about being healed. Because miraculously, after he steals my lunch, he's perfectly fine. Jesus Christ, this guy's a school bully. Never mind a good Pokemon. We then run into Arvin, someone who I've been having trouble with at school for years. He seems to think he's better than me and because he's doing these Titans instead of the gym. But everyone knows the gym challenge is the one you want to be doing if you're going to be a strong trainer. Proven by the fact that he's got this little squirrel that just goes down incredibly easy to my starter. Yeah, you cry away, Arvin. You deserve that loss. We can then move on and we can run into our first Pokemon. And that's going to be a poor me. You head into school. Stranger danger, stranger danger. Just as I'm about to get to school, though, we do run into the imposter yet again. Her first Pokemon, Quaxley, goes down quite easily to a few Leafages, doing minimal damage to us. Then after that, out comes her poor mate, and she is that much of a cheater that she's going to terrestrialize it. My Leafage does a bit less damage than I'd like, and their Thundershock does a round similar to me, even though I resist it. And knock it for around half health, but at that point she hits me back with a Thundershock and I get some bad luck. She actually manages to crit me with this, knocking me down to just 4 health. Because of that, my Sprigato does fall on the next turn, but we have knocked him into the red at this point. My own poor me then comes out and after 2 Thundershocks, because the first one didn't manage to take it out, we do beat her, even though she tried to cheat with a Terrestrialization. A little bit after this, though, we do end up getting the Terra Orb. Now, I decided to give myself a bit of a Terrastalizing rule here. I can actually only Terrastalize Pokemon that Nimona Terrastalizes during the playthrough. This means the only current Pokemon I have that is valid is actually going to be the Pormy. What's your favorite thing about Pokemon? Well, that would be the taste. Mm, a nice little magic app. Speaking of the taste of Pokemon, we go into the cafeteria and run into these combi. What's happening? Are we just squeezing them and getting the honey out? It's time to leave school, so we get on our stallion and head on our way. We don't make it very far, though. We actually end up running into a Venonat. And its confusion manages to wipe both of my Pokemon out. They both hit themselves a few too many times, and we weren't strong enough to take it out. And with that, we get our first loss. However, with Koraiden, we can actually skip past him if we want. But he's done dirty to us, so we can't be having that. Luckily, on the second time round, we don't actually end up hitting ourselves like we did in the first one, and therefore, he goes down with ease. We can then move on to the first gym fight, and that's going to be against the bug trainer, Katie. Poor me does manage to hit pretty powerful with a Thundershock. However, I think she thought of this. She's got her nimble to use Struggle Bug, and that's going to lower my special attack. However, it didn't save the poor little bugger's life as we do take it down using the next Thundershock. I don't want that lowered special attack, therefore I decide to switch out on the next turn against the Tarantula, but unfortunately its bug bite does some pretty heavy damage to me. Knowing I won't be able to take it out, I do decide to switch back. However, poor me takes an incredible amount of damage as well, far more than I was expecting to be honest. And unfortunately my Thundershock does less than half damage to it. And unfortunately, ultimately, this is going to lead to a loss for me. And even with small tweaks to my strategy, I do still end up losing another two times to this. After that, I realize I'm dumb. You can actually get Rockruff below the level cap at this point. Even with this advantage, though, I'll be honest, it wasn't as straightforward as I thought. I do lose a following two times. You know what they say though, third time is the charm, will it be the case for us now? My lead poor me takes down the nimble the same way it did last time, we do lose that bit of special attack but I think this is the right way to go. Her tarantula I do some decent damage to with a thundershock but she knocks me into the red and nearly wipes me out. 
since I'm faster, I can get off one more Thundershock and knock her pretty low into the yellow. But unfortunately, this does mean my poor me is going to be taken out. You've done me well, sir. Rockruff can quickly avenge him with a rock throw, though. Against the Teddy Ursa, I do hit him very heavily. However, his struggle bug hits me almost as hard. Thankfully, the next turn is the last one. I managed to hit my rock throw instead of missing it. That means he has no opportunity to get another move off, and we have taken the first gym down. My Sprigatito then evolves, and that opens up a whole new move tool for us. We've got a lot more attacks we can be using now. Battle me, for I am mighty. Gryden, blast him. We then have the Claw fight, but he's rock type, and I have a grass starter that's actually pretty powerful at this point. Therefore, I think you know exactly how that's going to go. It's then time to make our army of some flora. I'm also not too happy with Flora Gato's nature. Therefore, I give it an adamant mint that I'd found. We do then have the Brassius fight. Now, I will tell you this. It is a lucky thing we evolved as the new moves we're now able to use made this fight so much easier. All I need to do is set up a horn clause with Flora Gato. And since they only have grass moves to hit me with, I can almost fully set up with this if I want to. Once I've set up a bit, I can use a bite. Both his pet little and his small if will go down to me just using one of these. His Sudder Wooder does manage to survive a bite, but it does flinch. On the next turn, we do actually get a bit lucky. We bite him and flinch him again. The next turn, he does manage to survive on just a sliver and he can hit his rock throw, which does some pretty good damage to us. However, it's too little too late. We've still got two Pokemon in the back and all we need to do is hit one more bite and the Sudder Wudder is down. We see a bird and he's flinging some pretty hefty poo down a mountain. Yeah, that's pretty disgusting, so we better try stop him. Oh, Bomi's attacks really don't damage him much. And he does a lot of damage to our Rockruff. Rockruff then misses his rock throw. So our strongest Pokemon hasn't hit him and gets taken out by a not very effective mood being wing attack. And as you might expect, we do eventually get whited out here without doing any damage to him. Brilliant. But we're Nimona. We can't let that get us down. Let's just battle a load of trainers, get our head right back in the game and go back to fight this bugger. Something that might help us is Pormu becomes a bit less pathetic and evolves into a Pormo. Round two against the bird goes far better. It is still doing some pretty major damage to us with its wing attack, but our rock throws have hit, and we've done some pretty considerable damage to it by the time we're knocked into the yellow. Rockruff does then go down, but he's done a formidable job. Unfortunately for us, though, our poor mode doesn't actually know any electric moves that Nimona uses quite yet. Therefore, we have to use an arm thrust. It's not a terrible move because it does do some decent damage still, but an electric move would have knocked this thing out. Obviously, this means Pormo is going to go down. Florigato can hit it with a quick attack, but it's not enough. And we get hit with a wing attack, but just hold on ourselves. One more quick attack is enough to send him fleeing, and that can move us on to the next stage. You don't get a break between, though. And obviously, we're not going to be able to take it down on any health, so we do go down here. However, it seems we are very lucky. Upon coming back, we actually start the double battle with Arvin straight away. Now, as you can imagine, he's got a rock type helping us. This goes by so swimmingly. We then learn about Arvin's story, how he actually has a Sigma boss stiff. It's his partner and he wants to help it get better. Obviously, we want to help as much as we can. It's said the Herbamysticas will help with different problems. We need to take down the Titans to do it, so let's help him all along and finish them all off. We are then given 10 minutes in order to beat the Team Star Challenge, where we've just got to take out their Pokemon in the real world instead of a normal battle. Let's begin. Oh, it's already over. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. He has Dark types. Our freshly evolved Pormo is a fighting type, so I think you can see where this is going. Well... At least it would be if I could get more than two arm thrusts off. Yep, I lost to a dark trainer while using a fighting type. Fantastic. Because of this, I decide to grab the muscle band. This will turn my Pormo into a beast. However, it would seem the first time the beast did not want to perform. He yet again fails me with his arm thrust doing two or three. Therefore, we go down yet again. On the third attempt, Armthrus hits the Pawniard twice yet again, meaning it manages to get off an Aerial Ace and we're on lower health than we should be. The little sliver it survives on obviously isn't going to be able to withstand another attack, but it's still gutting. 
The river room does manage to get an intimidate off, so I decided the best thing is to switch out. I decided to bring out my Florigato as they just hit us with a metal stone to lower our special defense. I don't really want a lower defense, so I decided to bring in my Rockruff instead. Rockruff's Quick Claw does manage to activate, letting us go first and hit a Rock Throw. However, the Rock Throw does pretty pitiful damage, but they just use a metal sound and lower our special defense. And to be honest, we don't need Rockruff here. Our Quick Claw then does actually activate again. And this time when we hit the Rock Throw, it seems to do a lot more damage. I don't really know why. Maybe it's just the way the health bar looks. But either way, Rockruff goes down this turn. I can then bring out my Florigato, and this is one of the few Pokemon that I'm able to Terrastalize. Well, to be honest, for the restaurant, it's the only Pokemon, so obviously I'm going to make use of that. The Reverum is a touch faster, and it gets off a Metal Sound. However, at this point, it doesn't matter. Therefore, I hit back with a Magical Leaf, doing some decent-ish damage. The next turn, it does switch to Snarl, and this isn't brilliant, as it lowers my special attack. This means my next turn does far less damage than the previous one. Now, at this point, I know it's faster than me, therefore I go for a quick attack. This does mean the end of our Florigato as it hits me with a snarl and takes me out, though. That's it, we're down to our last Pokemon. It's all up to Pormo now. Thankfully, Pormo manages to use his Arm Thrust. And guess what? Instead of getting two or three off this time, he hits the Magical Five. And the next turn, he does get hit with a Wicked Blow, but thankfully for us, he manages to hit his Arm Thrust four times yet again. He must be finally out of his rut. And then we have the last turn. He just needs to hit three of his arm thrusts. And as you can guess, he does manage to do this because it's incredibly low chance he wouldn't hit them. And that's it. We've got the first Team Star Badge. We then have the joy of running into and finding a Gumi. Stay in the ball. After about 20 balls, this thing finally decides it wants to stay in. So we've got a new partner. However, it's yet to know a move that we can use. After that, it becomes Battle of the Streamers. Who's better, YouTube or Twitch? We'll find out by taking down Iona. My Rockruff can destroy her Watchroll with just two rock throws. One in part, thanks to the Quick Claw, meaning she didn't have the chance to get another Spark off. She then sends out her Belly Bolt. Now, I'm not going to be safe against this thing. Therefore, Florigato, you got to come on out. I go for a Home Claws and it hits me with a Spark and it does pretty minimal damage, which is about what I was expecting. I do the same next turn, but this time I get unfortunate. Their spark manages to paralyze me. Good thing I thought about this and managed to equip a berry to cure my paralysis. Unfortunately, though, he does do it again two turns later. I then use bite, and considering I've got plus four, it's pretty minimal damage. I then use a quick attack. This is because of the paralysis. I know I'm going to be slower. Therefore, I need to use that because I'm going to go down anyway, so I might as well get some chip damage in. I then use arm to with Pormo. And guess what? Every time I use it, his ability activates. So I've just made him five times stronger because it hit five times. Wonderful. Lucky for me, though, he just goes for a water gun. And this means on the very next turn, I can use one quick attack. It's a guaranteed KO and Belly Bolt is out of here. Heluxio does have Intimidate, so I decide to switch out and bring in Rockruff. However, Rockruff gets incredibly unlucky. Not only does he get hit pretty hard with a spark, he gets paralyzed by it. And even though his Quick Claw does activate, he gets paralyzed, and this means Rockruff managed to do nothing before he got taken out. Pormo does hit his Arm Thrust, but unfortunately for us, this time he only hits two times. However, we did get somewhat lucky. The Luxio went for Spark, and we've got Volt Absorb. Therefore, we're nearly on full health again. He then very much makes up for that too and manages to get off another five arm thrusts. He does get hit with a bite, but it does next to nothing. At this point, Luxio is within two hits. Therefore, we use them two hits and we take him down. We do then have the Miss Magius. Now, Miss Magius does get off a confuse rate. Obviously, it's a bit deadly, but we don't have to worry about this turn as we break through it and we do hit it four times. I don't want to risk it. Therefore, I decide to switch off into Gumi. Now... Gumi has learned at least one move we can use now in Flail. But since it's Terra Electric, I was expecting it to use an electric move. Therefore, I decided the best choice is to bring Pormo back in. However, she must have called this move as she used Confuse Ray. And after she hits me with a Hex, Pormo kills himself. Wonderful. Gumi does get a Flail off, but it's just not enough. It's not enough to beat him. And this does mean we have our 10th loss. I have a little bit of a think, and then I finally figure out a better plan. Therefore, we're going to go in for round two. 
Turns out with Rockruff, the watch rule must have been a range as this time we do take it out, meaning we don't need to rely on the quick claw. We do the same as last time using Florigato. However, I've thought about it this time. We've given it the muscle band, meaning its attacks are going to do more damage with less setup. This means we only need to use two home claws this time. I then bite it and the gods must be favoring me as we manage to flinch the belly bolt. I chomp down on him yet again the next turn. However, this time we don't get the flinch and he does manage to get off spark. Unfortunately, I get paralyzed and this time I don't have my berry. I then decide to use a quick attack, which I was expecting to take out, but I don't quite. And then it hits me with a spark. However, this spark only knocks me down to one HP. This obviously means on the very next turn when we hit him, he goes down. That holding on allows me just to get a fraction of damage off on the Luxio before it takes me down. Pomo then disappoints, he uses arm thrust and he only gets two off. However, this is a new battle. The Luxio doesn't know about Volt Absorb, so he wastes his turn going for Spark. Thankfully, on the next turn, Pomo doesn't only get two. He gets three, which is just enough to get rid of the Luxio. Miss Magius yet again starts off by giving us confusion. However, we've thought about this. We gave ourselves a berry. This cures us from the confusion and allows us to attack. Our attack is arm thrust and we get a bit lucky in getting the maximum amount of hits and doing nearly half damage to the thing. The next turn, it decides it's sick of trying to confuse us, so it goes for a hex. And to be honest, the hex is okay damage. Our arm thrust then hits three times and that knocks it to just over a quarter health. At this point, I am a bit low, and I know I won't necessarily take out on the next turn, so I decide to bring my Gumi in. Gumi does get confused on the turn after he comes in. However, Gumi does not care about confusion. He manages to hit a flail, and he knocks him for about half of the remaining health that he has. Gumi then gets hit with a hex pretty hard, but he manages to survive it on three health. Again, he shrugs off his confusion, and now his flail is supercharged. He hits the light bulb right off Miss Magius's head, shatters it into pieces and gets us the third gym bag. Go on, Gumi. Charlos the Char Cadet. Now that is something pretty cool to hear. After this, my Rockruff can finally evolve. That means we've got the Lycan Rock. We then have the Mela boss fight and this would be so easy, but her first turn, her flame wheel burns me. What are the chances? And yes, this did end up being a wipe for me all because of that. Literally, the next one, we annihilate it using only Rockruff. No worries whatsoever. All because of that burn we lost the first time. And I'm going to be honest, Team Star from here, they're a bit easy for the most part. So any of them that don't cause me trouble, I'm actually going to skip past. And to be honest, the Titans aren't too different. Look at this auto one, for example. It even takes itself out. My boss dip is starting to get a bit better, though. It even manages to stand up a touch and give off a good rough. You go, boy. While we're here, we might as well get an auto one gym of our own. I then have a bit of a bid for some good food. Now, I deserve this good food, but because apparently we use Kofu's money, he just takes it from me. Like, Jesus Christ, dude, I brought you a wallet. That's mine. We are then introduced to the opposite bead. After this, we do have the Kofu fight, but Kofu is a water type trainer. We have both a Florigato and a Pormo. Two types really good against him. And on top of that, for some reason, he started the war in a sandstorm. It'll come as no surprise that he did actually lose to us, but the funniest bit of this all is it wasn't us that took him out because I was switching during the time. Therefore, it was the sandstorm that finished him off. Hold on a minute. That, that's not a ditto. That's the wrong Pokemon. I then spend ages looking for a Dunsparce and the moment I find it, it digs underground. Okay. And after, I kid you not, an hour of searching for this thing, we finally managed to encounter one. I then do a few laps and manage to get my Pormo to evolve into a Pormot. Dunsparce becomes a D Dunsparce, so we can actually use him once we've got a couple moves. I then lose to Team Star yet again. However, this time it was completely my fault and it could have been avoided entirely. Literally, all I needed to do was grab the Earthquake TM and we give it to Orthworm. Combined with his beastly defense, making Flame Charge do next to nothing, even though it's super effective, we can then use the super effective Earthquake and do some major damage. It's been quite a long day at this point. Therefore, I decide I want some rice balls. I decide to order some up, but instead of actually giving me my order, they remove all the tables and chairs, so I don't even have anywhere to sit. Like, why? 
Larry, this cannot be forgiven. I wanted to eat a good meal. Don't open a restaurant if you're just going to remove the tables the moment someone wants to eat. I have my poor Mott use arm thrust. This manages to hit three times and do more than half damage. But unfortunately, he manages to get a yawn off and make me drowsy. Not wanting to fall asleep, I obviously need to switch out. I decide to bring in my Goomy, but this was a mistake. He manages to hit me with a slam and unfortunately, my little Goomster just can't survive it. This does give poor Mott the ability to come in for free and revenge his little buddy. We do then have the Dunsparce sparse come out, and although we do some okay damage with three arm thrusts, it's not quite half. He also can hit us with a drill run, which is super effective, so it does some pretty big damage to us. Knowing the likelihood of me hitting four arm thrusts is very rare, I decide to switch out because we're not surviving another one. I bring out Floragato as it's going to tank it because it's got a resistance. On the next turn, I decide to Terrasilize and I'm going to use Magical Leaf with it. It does some pretty decent damage, but unfortunately he uses Glare and that is going to paralyze us. The next turn, he's then going to use Hyper Drill and that does some pretty serious damage to us. And unfortunately, I get stuck in Paralysis. Because of that Paralyze, I have to use Quick Attack and it does next to no damage compared to what the Magical Leaf would. And that means I'm going to get taken out without doing much damage to him. At this point, though, poor Mott can take him out with one move, thanks to him being on just enough health, where two is a guarantee. His last Pokemon is going to be his Star Raptor. Now, he does terrestrialize it into the normal type, meaning it loses that flying type. And I opted to go for a Thunder Wave. I forgot this thing had Facade. Bit of a dumb move. Obviously, with him being normal type and that move being normal type, plus what I've just done to him, it's a guaranteed KO. Me being faster is brilliant though, because I can rock slide him and this rock slide actually manages to flinch. I then use another one and I'm not going to lie, I get incredibly lucky because it crits. That means this thing does go down in one. Bit of luck, but we made it past it. Now, this next Nimona fight should be incredibly easy. However, I made a mistake. I allowed her to set up with her Jack Sparrow duck. And I'll tell you now, this duck is pretty well equipped to take on my entire team. It has priority moves, it has super effective moves, and on top of that, I can't really touch it without my grass type. And that one little mess up that I did, that tiny mistake, meant she could sweep my entire team. No one left. On the plus side, losing this battle doesn't actually mean anything, as you can just carry on. You don't even get the option to rebattle her. Florigato finally gets in the spotlight and she decides to evolve just because of that. And since we're getting into the late game, Gumi wants to be a bit better for us. Therefore, it evolves into a Sligu. Are you ready to meet the MC of Rip? You know I'll rip you to shreds as I drop you so hard. I'm sat above the ground while I've knocked you six feet under. Well, after that, I think we better have take on Rhyme. I started out by using a flower trick on the Mimikyu as I wanted to break its disguise. I then go for a crunch on Burnett. The reason I do this is I thought it would take it out, but it just lives on a sliver. My Meowskarada is hit with a slash from the Mimikyu and Burnett goes for Icy Wind, but thankfully it misses Lycanroc, therefore it only affects my little cat. And I'll tell you what, we must have impressed the audience as they decide to give us an attack boost to both forms of attack. Burnett sucker punches my Lycanroc for minimal damage. So I decide to retaliate with my Mouskarada using a flower trick to take out the Mimikyu. Lycanroc didn't like that sucker punch, so he crunches the Burnett into oblivion. And I'll tell you what, the audience seem to love us so much, they give us yet another attack boost. It's a bit overkill, guys. And at this point, obviously she's going to go down. You've got to feel for her. Her own audience betrayed her and went for a newcomer like me, resulting in her being the one that's sent to the graveyard. Iron Tusks looks crazy powerful, but I'll be honest, it really is frail. So frail, in fact, that my Sligu is the one to take it out. Yes, my tiny little blob of... Whatever Sligu is a blob of. I know it's supposed to be a snail, but it takes it out. And with that wonderful show done, it's time we take on the Psychic Gym. I lead with Lycanroc, who gets a crunch off doing some pretty good damage, but unfortunately, we get reflected. That reflect does end up letting him hold on, and he can get a Zen headbutt off, but the next turn is going to be his last. Down to the giraffe in the hoodie, I say. I'm then expecting a Psychic Attack from the Gardevoir, so I decide to bring in my Masquerada. She goes for an Energy Ball instead, but I'm Grass-type, so it doesn't really matter. This switch improves to be incredibly deadly. Not only does the Gardevoir go down, her Espathra cannot handle the crit of a flower trick, so that goes down also. 
after that, there's the floor just. I will use a flower trick on it and I knock it down to less than half health, which is brilliant. However, it hits me with a Moonblast. Moonblast is incredibly heavy hitting. However, without speed, it means nothing because I knocked her less than half. That means my next turn, I'm going to move before her and I'm going to take her out. Zoom! Jesus Christ, that's a good one. <laughs> now we're off the slopes, it's time to face the gym, and that's gonna be the ice type gym leader. And final one, might I add. Frostmoth is incredibly frail and goes down to just one Excel rock. Like, that's not even a powerful move. The bear tick does manage to survive my rock slide, but my lichen rock is the king of flinching. And on top of that, he's low enough where one Excel rock is gonna hit him and take him out. I then get an Excel rock off on the Satitan for some minimal damage, and he hits me with a liquidation very heavily. I decide it's no longer safe to stay in. Therefore, I bring out my Pormot. Pormot is never going to go down to a liquidation. And on top of that, his newly acquired close combat is more than enough to take this little bugger down. And on top of that, he's strong enough to give us the world's first Oko on an Altaria with close combat. Amazing. We then have the fairy battle, and I was planning to have an Orthworn Supremacy here, but apparently my Pokemon just love to hit themselves. Literally, I barely got an attack off. Like, all of my Pokemon kept hitting themselves, and it resulted in a loss because of this. Seriously, I swear in this game, it's a 100% chance to hit yourself in confusion, because I never seem to get past it. Thankfully, on my second attempt, I managed to get through it, because this time I didn't get shafted and didn't hit myself in confusion like I did the last time. Literally, all it took was three of my Pokemon being able to hit. That's all it took. Fix the confusion rates, Game Freak! The dragon ended up being a cakewalk. Literally, the thing could barely do anything to me, so we annihilated him. Oh no, that wasn't the Titan! It was, however, just as easy as my poor Mark can take him out with a quick attack. Final sandwich does mean that Armor Bostiff is a lot better, though. We finally helped Arvin recover his trusty little companion. We deserve a touch of a reward, and therefore, our Sligu is finally ready to evolve. And after this, we have the final member of Team Star, Eri. She has already wiped me out because I didn't know this Tox Croak was here, though. It manages to hit a Brick Break for just under half health as I knock it into the yellow with an Earthquake. Orthworm's tremendous defense means we can survive another one, but obviously Tox Croak is not going to last the next Earthquake. Unfortunately, though, the close combat will not be able to be withstood on 7 health. However, it does give that Passamanian lower defenses for the next Pokemon. The Dunsparce is just strong enough to be able to withstand a close combat, but unfortunately, even after two defense drops, a Hyper Drill is not enough to take it out. And that does mean I unfortunately have to let myself go down here. That is such a shame as the Dunsparce could have done so much better. The Killing Spree does end here though. The Lycan Rock can then attack with a Rock Slide taking him out. This gives me the freedom to use a Crunch against his Annihilate, but unfortunately Lycan Rock can't do anything more. He gets close combat and that does mean he's going to go down. Meowskarada can then make the Annihilate disappear though by using a Flower Trick. Lucario does then come out. Meowskarada is half Dark type, therefore we can't keep it in, so I bring in Pormo who can take an Aura Sphere like a champ. After that is Fisco flying with a Close Combat and Lucario is going down. Against the Reverie, my Close Combat for some pretty awesome damage, and it ups both its attack and speed with a Shift Gear. On the next turn though, it uses a High Horsepower and Pormo cannot withstand that after an attack boost. Meowskarada gets hit with a combat talk, but I terrestrialize to get rid of my dark type to make it not KO. It also boosts my flower trick so I can do some decent damage to them. Unfortunately though, the next turn does mean my Meowskarada is going to go down. It did more than half, so it's obviously going to take me down here. They mustn't be able to take my Gudra out as they use Shift Gear yet again, and this is going to allow me to use a Dragon Pulse. Now he has been upgrading his defense, but all my attacks are special, so it doesn't matter. He then hits me with a combat talk. Now, not only does this thing do incredible damage, it paralyzes me. And guess what? I'm not able to attack because the paralysis activated. And for some reason goes for another shift gear. It had the killer hit, so I really don't get what the AI is thinking, but it allows me to get another hit off on it. It then misses high horsepower. And that means that we are free to finish it off. Literally, it could have taken us out in the last two turns and we got lucky. However, that paralysis was unlucky, so I'm taking it. We then have a Clavel fight, and his Pokemon are level 60. I was not anticipating this, 
And I'm not even going to lie to you guys. I did not stand a chance because I hadn't properly prepared. Now we know what's coming though, I do think we stand a chance against him. My Lycanroc can set up a stealth rock as he just gets yawned to make him fall drowsy. I don't want to be falling asleep though, therefore I decide to switch into Dedunspars and the Orangaru just goes for a reflect. He then uses a yawn against my Dedunspars but I don't really care as I'm using a hyper drill here. Not really wanting to fall asleep with Dedunspars either, I decide to bring Lycanroc back in. Luckily I come into a very small hit in foul play. I then use a crunch and the gods must have been looking down on me. I get a critical and this is going to take him out. After this, he does bring out his Abomber Snow. Now, I know this thing will take me out. Therefore, I just bring in my Orthworm. Lizard does hit me heavy and then I manage to get lucky yet again, hitting my Iron Tail with a crit. He goes ahead and hits us with another Blizzard, but we can hold on on 20-ish health and we can use an Iron Tail to take him out. Unfortunately, from here, Gyarados' Aqua Tail will send my Wern back underground. However, Pormot's Spark is obviously four times effective, therefore it's going to send this thing right down under. Palti guys then gets hit with a Spark for some pretty amazing damage, and on top of that, it tries to will with me and fails. Next turn, however, it is now faster thanks to the weak armor, so it gets it off, and that burn that it did to me is actually going to make it so I don't quite take it out. Next turn, it does hit me with a Shadow Ball and knocks me into the yellow. However, it is not enough to save it. My one last spark will take him out. Against the Amoongus, I decide just to Thunder Wave. The reason for this is this thing can be pretty deadly, so I want it to be slower than everything. Using this can make it slower and its Giga Drain will take me out anyway. This allows Gudra to get an Ice Beam off. Obviously, it's super effective. It does over half health. But he does Toxic us. That Toxic helps him nothing though. The Ice Beam takes him out on the very next turn. Scalar Ridge really can't do much against the Muddy Water. It does a lot of damage as his Shadow Ball hits my Chunky Boy for next to nothing. And because he can barely touch me, I can just go for another Muddy Water. And guess what? He's going to go down. Clavel, you tried your hardest, but you can't get past a good plan. It definitely wasn't the incredible look I got. Now, after this, we do have the fight against the big boss of Team Star. They're in a hoodie. Who could they be? It's Penny? Oh my god, who could have seen this coming? Now, I would love to pretend this was some crazy climactic fight, but honestly, the evolutions aren't brilliant Pokemon. Therefore, I managed to wipe every single one of them out. My team's just that way rounded. We have an answer for all of them. And with that, it's time for us to finally make our way to the Elite Four. The first of which, Meowskarada is super effective against. Ground type does not stand a chance, and we wipe the floor with him. No trouble. The second member, however, does pose a bit more of a challenge. I decide to start off with Dunsparce and I get two calls off while taking minimal damage, but I did allow them to set up a Stealth Rock. However, this does mean my Drill Run will one-shot it on the next turn. A Corviknight does then use Iron Defense though, and that renders my coils useless in terms of attack plusing. Therefore, my Dragon Rush does next to nothing. It then ups its defense yet again, making my Hyper Drill do nothing as well. It then uses a Body Press and that does some major damage to me. My Hyper Drill does about the same as it did last time and that means it's not too safe anymore. I decided Pormot was probably a good idea to switch into. Boy was I wrong though, his physical defense is pretty atrocious, therefore he takes some insane damage, especially with the defense pluses. Pormot close combats and then he's just waiting for death. But oh wait, he manages to hold on. And then he does it yet again. And then he dodges. This affection mechanic is so broken. Yeah, that actually led to the Corviknight being taken out by him. That is unbelievable. And even though he does get a close combat, knocking the bronze on less than half, unfortunately, this is where Pormo finally goes down. You did well, my friend. You did well. Lycanroc can then crunch away all of the problems we're going to have with this Bronzong. I then decide to crunch with him. Although it's not going to take the Magnazone out, it is going to get rid of the Sturdy. But unfortunately, the Flash Cannon is going to take Lycanroc out. Orthwars, four times effective Earthquake is obviously going to decimate it, though. Her Tink Tunk uses Brick Break, and it doesn't really do much to me. My Earthquake obviously is going to do massive damage to it, and I think you know where this is going to go. Bye-bye, Tinkerton, and hello, the halfway point of the Elite Four through. And now we've got Larry. However, he's chucked his normal types in the bin and opted to go for some flying types. 
I end up setting up some stealth rocks because all his Pokemon are flying type, so they'll take major damage for it. And he sets up a sunny day. I can then hit him with the rock slide, but he just manages to hang on in the red. However, Lycanroc needs to return the favor. He uses a solar beam against us and we manage to tank it on 13 health. We can then hit with an Excel Rock and because he's on such low health, we're going to take him out. I decide I might want Lycanroc later. Therefore, I switch out to the Staraptor's close combat because Gudra is going to tank it nicely. Unfortunately for me though, it's Brave Bird cannot be tanked and that's Gudra down. Due to the lower defense from the close combat, obviously an Excel Rock is going to finish this thing off. Altaria falls to just a singular rock slide, as does his Oricorio, which is brilliant because we don't want to get Tita danced. His Flamigo, however, can just hold on. It has that slight bit extra defense to survive. This unfortunately allows him to close combat and the close combat is going to take my Lycan Rock out. However, he isn't going to do any further harm. One spark from here is going to finish him off. Although he's the last member of the Elite Four, Hassel honestly isn't a hassle. Meowskarada nearly manages to one-shot the Noivern using just one player rough. He does have to take an Air Slash here, but it's not enough to take him out. Next turn will, however, get him finished off because we use one Slash and he's gone. Dragalge then does manage to tank a player of quite well because obviously it's neutral thanks to its poison typing. And that does mean Meowskarada is going to go down here. Udra then decides to go on a merciless rampage. Using only his Dragon Pulses and his Ice Beams, he manages to take care of the next three Pokemon without going down himself. And on top of that, he does some major damage with Dragon Pulse to Baxcalibur before he himself goes down. Also, one then fails to get the kill with an Earthquake. Disappointing. It really is no worry though, because we've got Palmer and his close combat is enough to get the job done. And with the Elite Four down, we are now finally ready to take on the champion. We are finally ready to prove ourselves against the strongest trainer. Dazzling Gleam doesn't really do much damage against us, as I hit with an Ice Beam for some decent damage. Espathra does the exact same, and I I hit with a Dragon Pulse this time, but it does manage to hold on with a Sliver. It has knocked me to low health, but I finally take it out with my last Dragon Pulse against it. Go Go loses about half its health to the Ice Beam. However, it didn't like it. It plays rough with me, and that is my Gudra finally down. I've then got my Orthworm out and he uses a Horn Leech, which gives him just enough health to manage to survive my Iron Tail. The next turn, however, is the end of the GOAT. Have a look, tanks the Iron Tail surprisingly well. But it's bad news for me because his body press does manage to do some pretty incredible damage to me. Also, his Iron Tail does knock him into being one shot range, but unfortunately, I'm going to get body pressed. Body press is pretty powerful, but friendship powers through. And this does mean that Avalug is going to go down on the next turn. Veluza does get revenge though, it aqua jets me and that takes me out. However, there is nothing it can do against my Meowskarada. I use a flower trick and obviously that's going to take him down. Next up, we have a King Gambit though. I don't want to stay in for this, so I switch into Lycanroc. I'll be honest, he's supposed to be fodder, but for some reason he survives thanks to friendship. I can't really touch the King Gambit, so I decide just to set up some Stealth Rocks. And obviously, he's going to take me out on this turn. However, he is Dark and Steel type, so when I bring my Palmer out, one close combat decimates him. I then follow suit and use a close combat against the Glamora, but that thing can't withstand us anyway, so that thing goes down also. It does spread its Toxic Spike, but she's toxic enough that we don't care. And with that done, it leads us on to the final with the Imposter. She's been pretending to be us the entire game. We cannot have this. Let's finally take her down. Her Lycan Rock sets up a Stealth Rock, but that's not going to matter anymore because now we can Iron Tail and she's on out of here. Pormot gets off a close combat and it does some pretty severe damage. I retaliate with an Earthquake and obviously this thing's going to go down. Orthworm has taken two of theirs out. She then has her own Orthworm and I decide just to trade Earthquakes. The reason is I know it's got Earth Eater and so do I, so I get health. It doesn't since it's already on full. I then decide it's time to switch into Gudra because I can't really touch this thing. However, I do get hit with the body press and it does a lot more damage than I was expecting. I then miss a muddy water, which isn't brilliant as it's gonna cost me my Gudra's life. On top of that, they get a crit, rubbing salt in the wound. I then decide to go for double shot with my poor mark. That's going to make me lose my electric type, and it guarantees he's not going to take me out with his earthquake. After this, I decide it's time to go for a close combat. Obviously, ours is a lot stronger and we've already done damage, therefore we take him out. The Dunce boss also goes down to a close combat, but at this point, my defenses are getting really weak. Well, we're already guaranteed to go down. Let's get another one off. We're not going to quite finish the Gouda off, but we do incredible damage to it, and that is going to allow it to get a Dragon Pulse off and kill us. 
However, it crit anyway, so I imagine it wouldn't have mattered even without the defense drops. Miascarada can then play rough, and obviously with the minimal health Gudra's got, it's going down. And as a surprise to nobody, the Quaquavel goes down to one flower trick. Incredible. Yeah, cry imposter cry. Next time, you'll think twice before copying me. That's not it for now, though. We go to Sada's lab, and it turns out it's been abandoned. All this time, she's been in the crater of Paldia, and no one's known. She needs our help to get her out of there. Everyone then jumps on our Porker Raiden's back. Like, this is my Pokemon. You guys use your own. He can't handle the weight of all of you. It turns out Sada's actually invented a time machine, and this is bringing Pokemon from the past into the present. We need to help her. Well, it turns out it's too late for us to do that. Unfortunately, Sada has fallen, and it's just an AI down here that we've been speaking to this entire time. She agrees to help us destroy the time machine. She understands just how deadly it can be to the world. However... I don't fully believe her. And a big bit of that is, as we're finally going to shut off the time machine, she decides to bring the earth from the ground like some earthbender out of Avatar. On top of that, she pulls out a load of Master Balls. Obviously, she's been hacking her own AI to get them. It would seem we have no choice but to battle her though. Miascarada lead isn't exactly ideal here, therefore I decide to bring in my Lycan Rock. Unfortunately for me though, this lunge is pretty powerful even against the Rock type and it knocks me less than half health. My Rock side does do minimal damage, but it does flinch. I decide because I'm doing so little damage, my best move is to Stealth Rock. Unfortunately, this lets them get off a low sweep and that is going to be the end of my Lycan Rock. Gudra hits a Dragon Pulse, but again, it doesn't do amazing in damage and the lunge knocks me really low one more does manage to knock it to a sliver but unfortunately for me at this point they use leech life leech life is going to give it some health back and take me out after this i can use a player off and finally get rid of this pesky slither her next pokemon is her scream tail this thing's fairy so i'm expecting a fairy move therefore i terrestrialize to get rid of my dark type ensuring i can survive one flower trick does some pretty amazing damage and that player off comes through just as i was expecting so we tank it like a beast obviously with the damage i'm doing my next move is gonna take it out the next move is Mystical Fire, and unfortunately for me, it manages to crit me. This does mean that my Meowskarada is going to go down. The Dunsparce does tank a Thunderbolt very well, and his Drill Run does some pretty good damage to them. Obviously, because of that, I'm going to finish it off on the very next turn. Brute Bonnet goes for a Sucker Punch, which nearly takes me out, but thankfully for me, it doesn't, allowing me to get a Hyper Drill off. It then decides to Giga Drain me, and unfortunately, 20 health is not enough to withstand this, so my Dunsparce is gone. Because of its Dark Typing, Pomo can come in, and it can use one Close Combat to take it out. Next up is Sandy Shocks. Now, I know I'm going to be able to take this thing out by just switching to my Orthworm because it's going to use a ground move and I'm going to tank that thanks to my ability. It then uses a Discharge and that does a lot of damage to me, but I can get an Earthquake off doing very similar amounts. Expecting another Discharge, I decide I don't want to lose my Orthworm, so I decide to switch into Pormot and its Volt Absorb makes it redundant. After this, I can use a Close Combat and it's a guaranteed KO with it being on such low health. Finally is her Roaring Moon. Now, I know this thing's going to take me out with an Earthquake, but guess what? Orthworm's still in the back, so he can bring him in and he even get some health back from it. And the damage it does to me is nothing. It can't really touch me. Therefore... I do more damage than he does. And that leads to it going down. We've actually managed to beat the Roaring Moon. And I'll be honest, during this fight, I didn't think this was going to happen. I thought I was going to lose. It's not over yet, though. The air has one Pokemon left. And that is going to be the other Coridon that managed to kill the original Sada. It also stops us from using our Pokeballs. And this means the only Pokemon we're able to use is Coridon. I don't know if you know, Nimona never had a Coridon. Therefore... We have failed the challenge.